Hello, I'm Ari. And I'm Claudine. Welcome to Proving the Negative. We're a podcast all about exploring the different sides of cybersecurity, from political science to computer science, international relations to mathematics. Join us as we talk to our friends about the work they do. So my elevator pitch kind of starts with introducing this idea of trust and reputation as very multifaceted concepts. Our experience of them is psychological and human and social, understandably. But there's a whole other perspective that we can take on them, uh, which is this kind of more formal or computational one. So here, rather than talking about them in terms of describing behavior or how we feel about them, which are, of course, very valid and important aspects of trust, we can also try and talk about them in terms of more prescriptive or, or even descriptive, but very precise models, which can be either be using math to describe trust or reputation behavior, or even something that can be simulated by a computer. Now, of course, trying to describe human behavior mathematically is a huge endeavor. As a computer scientist with an interest in these concepts, we can find a really happy medium in cybersecurity. My research talks less about individual behavior, though, of course, we try and account for that. We talk more about the context in which humans and computers interact. And this is where cybersecurity becomes very important, because a really important idea in trust and reputation and in these sorts of social interactions is, is that of a network. And a network is sort of just this measure of interconnected individuals, which may be people or computers or who knows. And the point is that there's some really powerful mathematical and computational tools for talking about networks. We want to try and take these tools and, and use them to try and describe things like how information might move around a network. Connectivity. So, for example, this person might have a lot of connections and this person very few connections. And finally, how, how can these sorts of behavioral aspects be exploited and how could those exploitations then be mitigated or prevented? <laughs> There's a lot to unpack here, right? What is a model? What do you use them for? It's, it's, it's almost like a toy. It's a way of describing some part of the world with, without, of course, having to go and, and, and build that entire part of the world. Physics is a, is a really good example of a model, uh, of a mathematical one, where rather than setting up every possible physical thing we can, like, for example, always testing pendulums by actually building a pendulum and swinging it around, we can instead come up with a, a linguistic description of them in this precise language as to how this thing behaves. And models don't always have to be mathematical. Even, even the way we talk about ourselves, oh, I, I tend to be an optimistic person, or, oh, I, I, tend to, I tend to prefer spicy food. These are models, right? These are descriptions of ourselves that try and capture us, e even though it's not necessarily us, it's just a sentence. You also mentioned you were trying to account for behavior. Could you unpack that? The world is complicated and humans are a particularly complicated part of it. Let's say you have this description of this network and you have a really good description of how if A communicates to B, then it takes this long and it happens in this way and all this. That's great. What really becomes important when we talk about human behavior is decision making. Why does A communicate to B or, or when do they choose to do so and what do they choose to communicate? And that's where humans get really complicated. What we try and do is define mathematical descriptions of, of a person's behavior. So, for example, let's say you're trying to describe the time it takes for A to tell B about something new they found out. There's lots of different mathematical functions describing, you know, as time passes, what's the likelihood they communicate. Exponential distribution is just to sort of throw the term out there is a very common one that might be used to model someone who's trying to communicate as much as they can. Because what this exponential model does, it essentially just says that regardless of how much time has passed, zero to five seconds and five to 10 seconds doesn't matter. All that matters is they're very likely to try and communicate sooner than later and as soon as possible. Just one quick question. Do I need to know what exponential distribution means? One really, really gorgeous thing about the exponential distribution that really distinguishes it from all the others, uh, just to, to, to give a, an example of why it's very useful in this kind of research, is that it's got this property that a lot of people call memorylessness. The easiest way to describe it is the eagerness, if you like, of someone to communicate doesn't really change with time. Whether five seconds have passed or whether 10 seconds have passed, the chances of you communicating in the next five seconds is always the same. The, the chance of you communicating between times five and 10 is the same as the chance of you communicating between times 20 and 25 if you haven't communicated yet. We're not trying to capture things like, do people communicate more at midday or do people communicate more at lunchtime? We're just trying to capture this idea that people want to communicate as soon as possible and they don't care what time of day it is. They don't care if it's 10 o'clock. They don't care if it's, if it's 5 p.m. They just want to get the information out there. And that's not always a perfect model. But when you're trying to describe very big networks like Facebook, where a lot of people are communicating all throughout the day, it can become fairly realistic in terms of capturing the sheer level of conversation that happens. While knowing what a distribution, an exponential distribution is, is important if you were wanting to look at our specific model, it is not at all necessary to understand trust as a whole, because it's sort of just one aspect of how we're looking at it. We can try and model 
semi-realistic pseudo people. Of course, these aren't real human beings. This doesn't describe real human beings perfectly, but it is like a statistical average of human behavior, if you like, that we try and capture. And that can come from psychological research and some things I've, I've been involved in. We've looked at psychology papers and tried to take some numbers from there in terms of who communicates and how often. And, and sometimes uh, for the more kind of very mathematical or very theoretical stuff, we just try to take the most reasonable behavior we can that's still a simpler and, and more reasonable mathematical thing to implement uh, and describe. You said that you were looking at various types of behaviors that you'd drawn on some psychology literature in your research. What are the behaviors that you've been looking at? There are a lot of robust models for things like personality type, how conscientious people are about sharing certain kinds of news. That piece of work was very much about sharing news and sharing fake news. And, and it will also talk about things like how extroverted people are, so how much they communicate and how many friends they might have. The kind of research that gives a statistical or average gloss of human behavior can be really, really powerful for us because it means that rather than trying to like capture the nitty gritty of human behavior, which is very, very hard to describe mathematically, instead what we can do is capture generalities in human behavior and say, you know, if we were trying to capture an average human being in a particular context, this is what it would be. The paper we were looking at was, was done in Italy. And, and the point is, you know, Italian people might behave differently from, say, people living in France or people living in the UK. Taking these papers, saying, what do they say about human behavior and how can we describe that mathematically, but then also kind of respecting the limitations. Let's turn it around. Let's to you. We're talking about everyone else, we're talking about models and generalizations. How have you approached the biggest challenge in your own research? Through a blend of my interests in, in, you know, in computer science and psychology and human behavior and, and even, even personal experience, one of the most important questions I have, questions of how people's personal experiences influence how and why they trust. See, the thing about trust is a lot of it really is about our expectations of other human beings and our experiences with other human beings is what drives that behavior. It's really interesting that you'll see in a lot of research around trust and reputation, whether it's online or offline, the kind of social backgrounds people have, the experiences they have, things like gender or age or nationality, political perspective, all of these things influence who we trust and why we trust them and what can break that trust and what can make that trust. So for me, there's so much more to be learned about how an individual's experience, both in terms of the world they grew up in and, and the people they interact with, how that influences the decisions they then make in later life and the kinds of people they trust and why they trust them. If we really want to understand why people behave the way they do and, and how to help people make good decisions, if it's our role to do so, understanding where people come from is, is the only way to get to the root of it. Is there a big question that you would like to investigate if you had unlimited resources, be that time, money, person power? This idea of the biggest challenge is so interesting. I was thinking to myself, is this from a sort of methodology perspective in terms of learning new things to code or learning new kinds of maths? But there's also this personal aspect of doing the PhD, right? The amount you have to just learn to deal with the unknown as a researcher. Because, you know, up until now, there's two things that you, you know for sure. And one is what you need to learn, because, you know, regardless of whether you learn it or not, when you sit down in a lecture hall for the first day of a new course, they give you the syllabus. This is important for the, for the exams and this might not be. And another thing you also know is that someone knows the answer. There is a marking scheme out there. And if you can't find the answer, someone can find it for you and help you get to it yourself. As a researcher, all of those things are gone. First of all, no one knows what the answers to your questions are. No one knows what they even look like, whether you should talk about them mathematically or psychologically, who knows? Left with this double problem of, first of all, asking yourself, how do I even begin trying to answer this question? And second of all, how do I even know I'm, I'm right when I get there? Is there a right? Is there a right answer? Long story short, I feel I think I dealt with this the way a lot of, a lot of people do. And, and I've, I've really been quite happy being part of the CDT, I guess, just because we've had so much interaction with researchers who are like PhD students who are a few years in and, and postdocs and professors and so many people who've gone through all of this. And the, really the biggest thing is just to understand that as a researcher, you're not really looking for the right answer a lot of the time, what you're looking for is to just add to human knowledge, right? To, to come up with new answers and sometimes better answers and sometimes just completely trying to give a new perspective on something. Like for example, trying to say, can we describe trust computationally? For me, that's been one of the biggest challenges for sure. And really it's just a perspective shift. How does trust link to reputation? There's a thesis that's well known for being one of the first to start off my area of what people call computational trust. A big part of the first few chapters of the thesis is, is just talking about how many different definitions of trust there are and whether you talk to a sociologist or a psychologist or whoever. But for me, the way I define trust is quite simply asking yourself the question, if I had to rely on this person, 
you don't have to rely on them. You don't have to depend on them. But if I were to depend on this person, would they do what's good for me? Because I think that's a big part of what trust is. It is about dealing with the unknown. I take, at least in my research, a very particular view of what reputation is. And that's sort of just an idea of generalizing trust to this more social aspect, where you can say trust maybe just comes from my interactions with you, say, at first, you could say a very simple way of looking at it is you, you and I interact and, and I can build up trust that way. Reputation becomes important because we as human beings anyway have this idea of exchanging information about other things and about other people. Without having ever interacted with you, I might have a friend tell me something about you. You know, I might have a friend say, oh, Ari's a friendly person or Ari, Ari's helpful or, or uh, who knows. To me, that's what reputation is. It's when we make trust-based decisions off of not just our own experiences, but the experiences of people around us, the kind of narratives that exist of a person or of a thing or of a company or of a, a new games console or whatever. To me, that's what reputation is. It's that social aspect of trust, that narrative aspect of trust where we're telling each other about things, even though we haven't had those direct experiences. And you can have opinions passed from person to person to person and none of them, you know, none of them but the first has actually interacted with the thing itself. And that's very, very interesting. At the same time, very, very risky. What's interesting about it and what are the risks? So what's interesting about it is how powerful a mechanism it is for really human behavior and human survival. From person to person, from tribe to tribe, from friend group to friend group, this idea of stay away from that person or that place, it's not good for you. Or, or no, that's a lovely person, or, that's a lovely place. But the problem with that power, as is the case with most things involving language, is that while it, it, it's so useful for exchanging that information and, and almost giving us eyes that stretch to the other side of the world, if you like, the danger there is without direct experience, there really is a difference between me interacting with you directly and me hearing someone talk about you. People can fake it. You can say what you like about a person and what you say about a person now might be not true of them later, or it might not be true of them in a different context. It's, it's a bit of a dark perspective to take, but it's a realistic one. A woman might have a good experience with another woman, but a man might not have a good experience with that woman. And, and similarly, a man might have a good experience with another man, but a woman might not have a good experience with that second man. That's why it's really important that not only can these things be faked, but they can also just be wrong because Sometimes we just don't know what we're talking about. And it's really important that we understand the context in which this information is gathered and from whom and, and, and what biases they might have and all of these kinds of things. Bouncing off of that, we didn't start with this and you come back around to it. What does trust mean? I think it's a concept that a lot of people might understand but struggle to define. So how would you define trust? Making a model that you can make sense of, of wanting to capture something meaningful it has to be computational, mathematical, well-defined. Sociology, discussing human behavior and, and things like that, has been making fantastic steps with network theory and the use of this kind of structure in describing interactions. This is very important for trying to account for nuances. Traditional uh, epidemiological models assumed that everyone was in contact with everyone all the time. And they were very simple mathematically in that way. You know, they could be useful and they could say some meaningful things, but a lot of the time they would fall short. One of the ways that they've been made much more powerful is with this network structure. And the reason why this network structure is so good for capturing the nuances of these social interactions is that it really is trying to capture this fundamental idea that our relationships are made up of this big, messy, interconnected mesh of individual relationships from object to object. So person to person, computer to computer, person to computer. The point is, your relationship with the group is, is so much about your relationship with the individuals of the group. There are uh, definitely methods in, in networks theory to capture this aggregate of relationships as well. That would be a bit more advanced. The reason we use the model we do is very much just because it's about respecting the relationships, respecting the concept of relationship as the fundamental social atom, if you like, that society and social interaction is relationships. Sean, when you say we... 80% of the time, me and my supervisor, and in the other 20%, me, my supervisor, and maybe some collaborators. When I say we, really, by and large, I'm talking about this community of people in some diverse fields, like computational trust and analytical sociology and all these other buzzword terms. People fascinated by formal models and formal methods, you know, they have backgrounds often in physics and computer science, but who really do care about these things too. Some people love doing maths for the sake of maths, and some people love studying people as they are people like myself, people who put these two worlds together of these, these perfect models that we make up in our heads and this messy, complicated world that we actually live in, trying to find some way of describing the latter in terms of the former. But Sean, social sciences are not real sciences. How could you do this? I don't think very many people use the word science having ever attended a philosophy of science course or, or read a, a book on the philosophy of science. There is a lot of nuances to what a science is. And a really big aspect of it is really just about 
trying to be humble to the experiences that we have. This idea of social science as not being a science is, it's not a debate I really understand. I think it's good to hear that articulate, because for those of us who do a lot of inter multidisciplinary work, you hear a lot of well, social science isn't real science, or and we should just not take those into account because they can't run an experiment. You can't just say that someone's not a scientist, in my opinion, because they can't run an experiment. Physicists can't always run experiments. You know, simulations have become such an important part of physics. Sure, it's nice that in the past we could get a pendulum or a bunch of particles and shoot them at each other. But to me, science is really just about this constant interplay between these narratives and models and little toys we make up in our heads to describe the world we live in and these actual experiences that we have. And if someone is trying to respect both of those and is trying to find some crazy beautiful link between the two, that's really what a scientist is. I am curious to know what you think your most notable failure is over the last year and how did you overcome it? I'd say one of my biggest failures was trying to come up with this perfect model at the beginning, which, which didn't exist. Spending a lot of time worrying and not getting things done when in fact, sometimes all you can really do is dive into those kinds of observations and experiences and see what happens. The reason this is, is hard to answer isn't because I'm completely free of failure, but rather just because, you know, as, as I said, as a researcher, you're just wading through the unknown and, and there are so many things that can change at a moment's notice. A definite failure in my approach to things tied into this idea of what am I actually trying to do as a researcher? At the beginning, having no idea what I was doing, for one, getting lost in this tornado of theoretical perspectives and practical perspectives and people gathering data sets and running statistics on those and people making up these very deep theoretical models of how human brains do logic and all this kind of stuff. One of my biggest failures was honestly just a result of the fact that I spent so much time at the beginning trying to come up with this perfect multidisciplinary approach that accounted for sociology and psychology and logic and maths and networks and all these things, spending a lot of time just muddling through and not really being able to get started on anything. When you're doing multidisciplinary research, there's so much that you have to learn. As my supervisor often says, you have to just start with something. It's often in the mistakes you make and the failures that you learn how your model can be better. There is no methodology to find the answer with these things. You know, it really is about a huge group of people trying all kinds of different things to try and learn more about the world. And all of those things are valid and important. And some of them may have more practical use sooner than later, and some may not. And that really isn't what we're doing as researchers. We're not trying to solve problems quite in that way as much as we're trying to answer questions. What is cybersecurity? I think cybersecurity has to revolve around the notion of information technology. At the moment, what most of us are talking about is, is computers. Whether you want to introduce books and things into that notion, I think you can. Cybersecurity is more than just computer security or computer science. It's again about taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture. To give a very brief anecdote, Zoom bombing, people joining Zoom calls and displaying unpleasant images or saying very unpleasant things. I remember a very interesting conversation I had with someone where they said that they didn't believe it was a, a security problem because if you put a password on your, on your Zoom call, then, then no one can get into it. And I found that fascinating because, to me, when we're talking about security, we are, of course, trying to secure computers. But the reason we're trying to secure these computers is because they mean something to human beings. How can these new technologies be used to do bad things? And how do we prevent these bad things being done? And, and what are bad things? And that goes into complex areas like secure devices and things being used in cases of, you know, like domestic abuse and stuff like that. You know, like it, it might be a good thing that you can put you know, tracking on your phone if it's, for example, you know, to keep your child safe or something. But at the same time, in, in an abusive relationship, it can be a dangerous thing. It can be used as a tool for bad. Um, and that's why cybersecurity, in my opinion, is absolutely inseparable from the social and psychological aspect of it, because ultimately it's human beings who value these devices and it's human beings who use these devices. And we have to learn not just about human behavior and not just about device behavior, but the interaction between the two to, to really get anything meaningful done. Otherwise, you're just encrypting data on a box and putting it in that box and you're putting that box in a safe and no one's touching the box. Great. That's a very safe box. There's also a useless box and it's also a meaningless box. Yeah, I love it. It's not helpful to know what's the point. Sean, I think that my, that's probably the best answer we've gotten to that question so far. Definitely the most outraged. Do you have any tips for keeping up to speed with cybersecurity? For me, reading papers, looking at direct results that have been found. For someone more technical, that might be looking at bug reports talking about reputation, there's a more social aspect of blog posts and this community. If something's not your area of expertise, on the other hand, I would say that's, you might not be an expert enough to read papers or the best way to keep up with it is to engage with the community. Follow someone who does seem to know what they're talking about. Ask people questions or read forums, anything really like that. Watch lectures or talks online. 
Join us next week for another fascinating conversation. In the meantime, you can tweet at us at HelloPTNPod, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. The title there is PTN Pod. See you next week. Bye. This has been a podcast from the Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity at the University of Oxford, funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council.